On March 27, 2014, exactly 35 years after the nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island, Fairwind's Arnie Gunderson gave this keynote presentation at Penn State Symposium TMI at 35 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Arnie is the chief engineer at Fairwind's Energy Education. Since 2008, Fairwind's has been a nuclear safety advocate, working for safer nuclear plants, better government regulation, and proper oversight. Arnie has more than 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience. He attended Risk Linear Polytech Institute, where he earned his bachelor's degree cum laude, while also becoming the recipient of a prestigious Atomic Energy Commission Fellowship for his master's degree in nuclear engineering. Arnie holds a nuclear safety patent with a licensed reactor operator and is a former nuclear industry senior vice president. During his nuclear power industry career, Arnie also managed and coordinated projects at, at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. Additionally, Arnie has served as an expert witness for the investigation of the Three Mile Island accident. He also provides leading and extensive commentary on the ongoing Fukushima nuclear disaster and a variety of news media outlets such as Democracy Now!, CNN, Al Jazeera, and The Real News. On a personal note, my own dissertation research on Fukushima brought me to the work of Arnie several years ago. His public commentary and breadth of knowledge on this global catastrophe is unsurpassed. Please welcome Arnie Gunderson. Hi, I, um, I realize it's late, you're tired, you're hungry, and your butt's hurt. And, uh, <laughs> I will, uh, this was going to be a 40 minute uh, speech, but I'm going to try to cut more than five minutes out and, and, and still touch on the issues I wanted to. So uh, thank you for hanging around uh, as long as you have. Um, I was an expert at the TMI trial representing the plaintiffs. Um, there was 10 of us that, that, that would tell an entirely opposite story from the story you've heard from the NRC and the story you've heard from general public utilities. And so I sort of feel like I'm representing those 10 people and the, the 2,000 plaintiffs in the, in the TMI case as well. Um, so anyway, thank you for, um, uh, for being here. Um, there, there's many lessons uh, that could be learned and should be learned, not just from TMI, but from the other five, the five meltdowns that occurred in the last 35 years. And five is, is TMI um, and Chernobyl and three meltdowns at, at Fukushima. So we've had five meltdowns in 35 years. What are the real lessons that, uh, that TMI, we should have learned from TMI, and 35 years later we still have not learned? Um, this is me in 1975. My wife says I've aged well, but <laughs> um, I, I was a, an engineer at, uh, on a power plant almost exactly identical to, um, uh, to Fukushima Daiichi. And then um, in 1977, I moved to New York State Electric and Gas right across the border from Pennsylvania in the southern tier. And um, I was there when the accident occurred at, uh, at Three Mile Island. As you can see, I was a member of their speakers club and I was asked by the uh, company to go on television, uh, which, I, which I willingly did, and I, um, uh, I talked about the accident and I told people that um, there, was, that there was essentially no damage, all the safety systems worked. I then went to um, the malls and handed out brochures to mom saying don't worry about this accident and um, um, appeared in the boardrooms of uh, the briefing executive saying don't worry about this accident. <clears throat> and I had a t-shirt that said I survived Three Mile Island. Um, then I became a, a senior vice president in the industry, and um, uh, when Chernobyl came around, I was, uh, uh, I was again on television, and I basically said, you know, that it's, it's a stupid Russian design. It couldn't happen here. But it's interesting that in 1979, when Chernobyl happened, the Russians said, it's those darn capitalists, and it couldn't happen in Russia. So we both were pointing fingers at each other over a period of a couple of a couple years. Um, in, then in, in 1993, though, 
I was, I was hired as an expert witness to represent the plaintiffs in the uh, litigation against GPU. And that gave me the opportunity to read thousands of pages of, of information. And, and I realized I was wrong, that there was a significant uh, uh, health damages and there was significant radiological releases from the accident at, uh, at TMI. Um, so it was that formative experience in 93, 94, 95, during the trial that, um, that, that fundamentally changed my worldview on what happened at Three Mile Island. Um, GPU never told the NRC, never told Governor Thornburg, and then the NRC marched into that same trap and never told the public the magnitude of the releases that, uh, that occurred at Three Mile Island. We found that out, the 10 of us, those, the, that group of experts, found out how bad things really were. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we never got to trial. Um, Fairwinds, by the way, is, um, is a company started by my wife, Maggie. Um, we're a 501c3. And we, um, we work on uh, safety issues and trying to get those safety issues out to the public in great detail. On the 30th anniversary, I spoke in Harrisburg, and uh, on our website, on the Fairwinds website, we have the, um, the tape of that presentation, which goes into lots of technical detail, 40 minutes of technical detail on this accident. So if you're interested in the raw technical detail on this accident, I'd urge you to take a look at the Fairwinds site. Now, when you're on the Fairwinds site and you listen to this thing, there's funny music in the background for the first 10 minutes. We did it in a conference room right off the rotunda, and there was a marching band in the rotunda. So people have said, what is that music? And we can't take it out. So you'll have, uh, but the presentation is audible, but there's a, a little bit of background noise. Anyway, I came to the conclusion as an expert on the trial that at seven o'clock in the morning on the first day of the accident, an evacuation should have been ordered because radiological releases had already begun to occur the radiation inside the containment was so high that the written procedures that, that TMI had in its possession required an emergency evacuation at seven in the morning. Those emergency evacuation orders were ignored. Well, then three years ago, when, um, when Fukushima Daiichi occurred, I was watching and I could see the same lies being being presented to the Japanese people that we had um, with TMI and that the Russians had after Chernobyl. And so three years ago, I dedicated myself and I said, I am not going to let this happen to the, to the, uh, to the Japanese. I saw it happen here. I know the games that will be played. And I've dedicated my life to making sure that Daiichi isn't covered up like TMI and, and, and uh, Chernobyl. So anyway, the, the concept of an accident I have a real problem with. Uh, this is from the Diet Commission. Um, the, the Diet is the Japanese parliament. They issued a, a, a report on their accident. Um, it says the accident of Fukushima Daiichi cannot be regarded as a natural disaster. It was a profoundly man-made disaster that could have and should have been foreseen and prevented. And its effects could have been mitigated by a more effective human response. That same statement could be made about TMI and about Chernobyl. So looking back over the, over the 35 years of accidents, I, I kind of narrowed down to five basic areas that lessons we should have learned and, and haven't. The first is that safety systems will fail. The second is that human beings will fail. The third is that political systems will fail. And if any emergency plan are still left, the political systems are in the middle of this speech, so please stay. <laughs> um, the fourth is that people will die. And the fifth is that the risk has been grossly underestimated for nuclear power. Well, let's look at the first one. Lesson one, safety systems will fail. Um, there's four parts of that. And the first one is this thing called single failure criteria. And what that means is that in a nuclear plant, when something breaks, a pipe breaks, you also have to assume that something else is going to break too. And that other thing that breaks is a single failure. 
So the nuclear plant has to be capable of not just withstanding the pipe break, but also has to be capable of withstanding the other single failure. And that's like cardinal law for nuclear power, single failure criteria. But these five disasters have shown us that one component, that more than one component will fail during a nuclear catastrophe. Several safety systems and several operating components failed at each of these accidents. So the concept of single failure criteria will lead to more accidents in the future. We really, moving forward, if you're going to pursue a nuclear alternative, you have to have systems that can withstand multiple component failures. And um, Greg Gasco has said the same thing. Uh, the public will not accept a meltdown every seven years. And in order to avoid that, this concept of single failure criteria has to be off the table. And we have to rethink our approach moving forward. Uh, the second one is that instruments will fail. Um, during each of the major catastrophes, the operators relied on instruments that were erroneous. At TMI and Fukushima Daiichi, for example, the instruments that they relied on for water level told the operators that there was a lot of water in the nuclear reactor when in fact there was none. And it was interesting, someone else put a slide up here earlier about, well, there's a lot of radiation in the reactor, in, in the containment, but we think it's erroneous. Did you see that slide? And it was interesting because as I was an expert, every reading that was true and really bad, they thought of was erroneous. Every reading that was erroneous but really good, they relied upon. And that's a trend that I always see in emergency response. Operators want to believe the instruments that lead them to the conclusion they want to get to. In addition to the, those instruments, every radiation detector was destroyed in all five of these accidents. So when we talk about the releases from Fukushima or the releases from TMI, we have no clue what was released. It's a scientific guess. The, um, the third thing is that hydrogen will explode. This is a, uh, the pressure inside the containment at Three Mile Island on the first day of the accident. This is a TMI graph from the trial. Um, the, you know, the unique thing is that thing right in the middle, that pressure spike, that's a hydrogen explosion. It happened on the Wednesday of the accident, on the 28th, at around between 1 and 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon. Hydrogen will explode. There was an explosion at TMI. Now, related to that is the next one is that containments will fail. Um, if you look before that spike, so to the left of the spike, um, zero on this graph, on the, on the y-axis, zero is, the, is atmospheric pressure. So after the accident, the pressure in the containment was higher than outside, just like the air pressure in a tire. The containment was doing its job. It was containing the, um, the energy. Then came the explosion, and look what happened after. The containment began to leak. There's no doubt, um, we had one of our experts was a Dr. Wrightblatt from University of Bridgeport, um, and he showed quite clearly that uh, the containment failed and about 10% of the radiation inside escaped at two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, uh, Okay, so that was a lesson. This is TMI. This is Fukushima Daiichi. Um, unit one is on the left and has already been destroyed. Unit two, unit three, unit four. Watch the one in the middle. That's a hydrogen explosion 35 years afterward. So whatever lessons we thought we learned at TMI, we didn't. Because the hydrogen explosions we were trying to mitigate after the lessons from TMI clearly repeated three times right before our very eyes at Fukushima. Uh, this thermal image is a picture of uh, Unit 3 at Fukushima. The large spot in the middle is the, is the spent fuel pool. And, um, but, but I want you to look at the four spots to the right of the middle. And they say 128C. That's 250 degrees. That's hot radioactive 
air escaping, not from the fuel pool, because it can't exist, water can't exist at over 212. That's hot radioactive air escaping from the nuclear containment. Now, this, is, uh, this lesson is uh, something that the NRC has known for 35 years, but I was in front of the ACRS, the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, two years ago, and the staff told the NRC, we assume containments do not fail. Let's see here. So TMI taught us that multiple components will fail. Instruments won't work. Hydrogen will blow up and containments won't fail. Guess what? Same thing happened at Fukushima. Multiple components failed. Instruments didn't work. Hydrogen blew up and containments failed. What have we learned in the last 35 years? Second lesson, human beings are not infallible. Uh, in each of the five meltdowns, uh, they all proved that nuclear, uh, that, that uh, operators were not infallible. At TMI, the operators didn't realize the, uh, didn't understand the position of a, of a critical um, handle on their control panel. Um, at Chernobyl, the operators didn't understand how the, op how the reactor operated at very low levels when they did the test that caused the explosion and the meltdown. And at, uh, at Fukushima, the operators turned off something called the isolation condenser and then couldn't get it started again when they realized, oh my God, we really needed that. Um, so you know, engineers are designing nuclear power plants for operators to work perfectly. Operators cannot fail in a nuclear plant. But I have a saying that just says, this is my saying, uh, sooner or later in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. But to blame the operators is wrong. I was an operator, and, and when you're in a situation, in a, uh, in a crisis situation, um, it, it's an extraordinary event, and things are happening faster than your ability to digest it. So the, the real lesson is not about operators failing to do the right thing. It's really about engineers failing to build in the necessary redundancies. It's really about engineers expecting the unexpected. And that was an interesting term. It happened uh, twice in the previous uh, the discussions today. So as designers and engineers, we have not expected the unexpected as we build these new nuclear plants and, how, and as we run these aging nuclear plants moving forward. Okay, lesson three, political system. Okay, so Penn Staters who are interested in emergency planning, this is, this is your moment. Um, we fail to learn that evacuation plans are more of a political construct than an effective plan. In each of these five accidents, the evacuation plans were not implemented effectively nor in a timely manner. Now, I was being deposed that in, the, in the TMI trial um, I was being deposed, and in deposition, uh, this, uh, and my position was that at 7 or 7.30 in the morning on the first day of the accident, there should have been an evacuation. All of the criteria in their procedures were fulfilled that they should have evacuated between 7 and 7.30. By 10 o'clock, uh, a friend of mine had actually gone down into the containment and measured the thermal couples indicating that the core temperature was 2,000 degrees there should have been an evacuation. And at one o'clock, they had an explosion. The plant manager was in the control room when the building shook. And four reactor operators signed affidavits that he knew there was a hydrogen explosion. So anyway, this is how the dialogue went in the, in the deposition. So I'm being deposed by the uh, attorney representing GPU. And his name was Chubb Wilcox, very, very preppy name. And he turns to me and he says, do you mean in the midst of all this confusion, you expected us to contact the governor? And I said, that's exactly what I mean. That you were confused, the governor needed to know. And yet at two o'clock in the afternoon, the plant manager goes to the governor and tells him everything's under control. So uh, it's clear to me that the plant staff understood the severity of the accident. 
um, before um, the governor had the slightest clue. Um, I got this, we, Maggie and I got this letter uh, sent to us in an email from a, a woman who was in 10th grade at Middletown High School on the morning of the accident. And here's what she had to say, and I apologize, it's kind of long, but it's awfully important. Um, so this is a 10th grade girl, Middletown High School, day of the accident. Our chemistry teacher had taught the whole, the whole semester on nuclear power and waste storage. And so he had run a Geiger counter out the window for the entire semester. The morning of the accident, my chem teacher started, my chem class started at 10. As we entered the classroom, the Geiger counter went from haywire, from a normal clicking to a solid buzz. He immediately picked up the phone and called the governor, called the governor Thornburg's office and reported the readings. The response was, we know, don't do anything about it. By 11 a.m., parents were coming to the school and pulling out their children. Of course, many people in town worked at the plant or had relatives who did, and they did not wait for a formal evacuation call. Kind of sad. In Russia, the authorities didn't notify anyone for, ten, for two days after the massive fire and explosion. And the Japanese, who are the best emergency planners in the world, they really know that earthquakes happen. The Japanese, the best emergency planners in the world, waited way too long to evacuate Fukushima Daiichi. When they did, they evacuated people into the high radiation areas, which is exactly what the emergency plans at TMI would have done. If people had evacuated, they would have been driven into the plume as opposed to being driven away from the plume if they followed the emergency plans. So the example in Japan is, uh, is illustrative of the magnitude of the problem. When policymakers rely on nuclear industry experts and industry regulators as the crisis unfolds. Several months ago, I had a, a long private talk with, with Prime Minister Khan, who's read my book, by the way, and he had me sign it. That was really kind of, kind of flattering. Um, and uh, I told him, uh, I tried to put myself in his shoes in the days immediately after the accident, being forced to rely on the small amount of information being released by Tokyo Electric and by METI, which is the Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industry. And I'll never forget what he said. So the Khan says to me, the information I got was neither timely nor accurate. That could have been Governor Thornburg on the first day of the accident. GPU didn't tell him that their high radiation in the containment, didn't tell him that they had measured uh, 2,000 degree temperatures in the reactor core, didn't tell him about the, uh, the explosion. So uh, he did not receive information that was timely or accurate in a policy making role. The NRC itself didn't know about the hydrogen explosion until two days later. So after 35 years of meltdowns, we haven't learned that corporations will do its best for them and their stockholders rather than tell the public and regulators the truth during a disaster. The unlearned lesson from these tragedies is that evacuation plans will not work correctly because people are terrified and that nuclear owners, regulatory agencies, and governments will refuse to tell the truth. Today, it's most likely that most evacuation plans will fail during a nuclear crisis. Critical infrastructure will be destroyed, including things like electricity, emergency sirens, traffic lights, um, which every emer emergency plan relies on for an evacuation. Here in the US, we only need to look at Hurricane Sandy, and Hurricane Andrew to see how critical infrastructure near a nuclear plant was totally destroyed. It's kind of hard to evacuate when your neighbor's house is floating down the street in front of you. Emergency planning isn't the only political failure. The governments of Japan, Russia, and the United States all grossly underestimated the amount of radiation that was released during the nuclear accident. Each believed they were preventing panic by not informing people of the magnitude of these tragedies. How many times have you heard there's no imminent danger? Only five days after the Fukushima Daiichi accident, when three reactors had already blown up on television, 
Secret the Department of Energy Secretary Chu was on CNN. I was an expert on CNN too. Chu was on and then I was on after him. Anyway, he was on Chu, uh, Chu was on CNN and he said that the accident at TMI, at Fukushima was a category five, the same as, as TMI. And um, then I came on and they said, well, what do you think of that? And I said, I didn't say it, but he's full of it. Um, and I said, no, I'm sorry, this is as bad as Chernobyl now and might get worse. So I said, it, this is already a level seven. Now Scott has proposed a, a level eight, which is uh, actually probably what this accident could have become if the fuel pool had caught fire. They don't have a level eight. Um, so um, here is Chu saying, witnessing th three nuclear reactors blow up on television, telling us it's no bad, no more, no worse than, than TMI. And it was obvious to every nuclear engineer I knew that we had, we had a Chernobyl on our hands. Um, and if you read the U.S. government transcripts, the NRC transcripts of the day of the, uh, of, they were published a, a year after the accident, but uh, that were occurring as all of this was going on. The NRC knew how bad this was and was as terrified as I was. But they didn't tell Congress and they didn't tell the truth to the public either. So operators at nuclear reactors are under extraordinary management pressure to keep the reactors running. They can make as much as a million dollars a day if the reactor operates. So this came from my expert report on TMI. I, the plant manager had a tape recorder running in his office when he called General Public Utilities, the owner of the nuclear reactor, and they were in Parsippany, New Jersey. So they're 150 miles away from, from TMI. He taped the call at 7.30 in the morning. Well, the phone transcript made it clear that he, the plant manager knew how severe the accident was and wanted to, to begin an evacuation. But his bosses in Parsippany overrode him and basically made him knuckle under. Again, that's in my, my expert report that never made it to trial. Okay. Um, a similar situation developed in Japan. Uh, the um, minister of uh, METI, M-E-T-I, the, the economics ministry said three weeks after the accident that the, um, uh, the, the top priority of the Japanese government was to save Tokyo Electric. Think about it. So from a political point of view, my overall conclusion is that nuclear power companies will systematically underestimate the severity of an accident and that public authorities will do the same. Lesson four, people will die. As a result of the accident at TMI, people have died, regardless of what the NRC and industry says. Hundreds of thousands died at Chernobyl and hundreds of thousands more will die as a result of Fukushima Daiichi. When estimating the health effects, most researchers attempt to guess at the amount of radiation that's released, but no one really knows what those numbers are. The health significance of these meltdowns is downplayed compared to the post-disaster financial repercussions of the meltdowns themselves. My favorite slide in the world, my favorite comic strip in the world is this one by Dilbert. Um, the boss come, turns to him and says, can you do this feasibility analysis? I can do it in two minutes. This is the worst idea in the world. Numbers don't lie. And then the boss says, our CEO loves the idea. And Dilbert says, luckily, assumptions do lie. So the, the message is what assumptions are these people using? And of course, when you, when you look at the assumptions objectively, the doses are much higher. So the, the good science after the accident is not what's on the NRC's website. The NRC says there's 10 million curies were released and they've stuck by that story for 35 years. Um, but in the, uh, in the case depositions, we got the GPU expert to admit that the NRC was wrong and that they're at least twice as high as the NRC. Then we also discovered this. Um, Lake Barrett's name was mentioned. Uh, Lake put this table together. He was an NRC guy and a friend of mine back in the 70s. And he shows that, um, in fact, 36 million curies were released from Fukushima Daiichi. Then, in his report, he divides that by four, which is nine plus, and they averaged it up to 10. So the basis for the NRC's number is Lake Barrett's estimate cut by four. 
And of course, Lake Barrett is now doing the same thing at, at uh, Fukushima. He's their point man telling people, you know, don't worry, be happy. Um, the, the real good science here was done by a guy named Steve Wing. Um, Steve analyzed the Susquehanna data, uh, the, the county data and the state data. Um, and he shows that um, there's much higher incidence of cancer up and down the river as compared to the valleys. Now, why is that? Well, there was another expert in the trial, a guy named Ignis Vergeiner, Dr. Vergeiner, who showed that during the accident, there was a temperature inversion, a very severe temperature inversion. The air was flat so that the radiation releases didn't go anywhere. They ran up and down the river valley. They were trapped in the river valley. So Vergeiner's meteorology matches Wing's epidemiology, and they both match what I believe came out of the plant. Now I gotta get back to that pressure spike again. The pressure spike shows that 10% of the radiation in the containment was released. But in the trial, GPU said in the containment was something between a billion and two billion curies. 10% of that is 100 million curies, 10 times what the NRC estimated. That's the good science. Um, it's not just TMI where scientists were, uh, were ignored. We have um, at Chernobyl, we've got Alexei Yablikov um, had published a book showing a million people are gonna die. Um, and Alexei was the science advisor to Boris Yeltsin in the, in the Soviet Union, certainly no lightweight. And then the, the saddest one is, um, is Yuri Bandashevsky. Uh, Yuri was thrown in jail for eight years because he published a report about Chernobyl heart, which is cesium attacking children's hearts after the Chernobyl accident. Throwing scientists in jail and covering up or maligning their work does not change the facts. Eventually, the truth comes out. Galileo challenged the orthodoxy, and it took 400 years for public acknowledgement he was right. The children at TMI, Chernobyl, and Fukushima can't wait 400 years. Okay, I'm getting there. Um, in Japan, the Abe administration has recently passed the State Secrets Act where scientists, journalists, anyone who talks about what they are measuring from Fukushima can be thrown in jail for five years. Um, that certainly puts a damper on, on any scientist who wants to publish his data. And we routinely get information from scientists at Fairwinds uh, Japanese scientists are smuggling out information to us to try to avoid the Japanese censors. Not only is Abe uh, involved, but you'll, you'll hear about the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and they're portrayed in the mainstream media as a nuclear watchdog. In fact, their UN charter is there to promote nuclear power. And they've been making deals with hospitals in Japan, saying that before the hospital releases any health statistics, the IAEA gets to review them. Well, radiation knows no borders. I think Fukushima taught us that, Chernobyl taught us that. The releases were a little smaller at, um, uh, at TMI. But radiation knows no borders. Uh, Helen Caldicott wrote a book that shows iodine being picked up at, at farms 150 miles away from TMI. Um, and she's got the references to prove it. Okay, last lesson. Nuclear risk is greatly underestimated. Um, when the NRC does a cost-benefit analysis, they use something called PRA, probabilistic risk assessment. Uh, those of us who criticize the agency call it prey. Um, and the best example is a deck of cards. If I, if I asked you what the odds are drawing a club, uh, the ace of clubs from a deck of cards, you would know there's 52 cards, there's one ace of clubs, the odds are one in 52. Well, when the NRC does a prey, a probabilistic risk assessment, they assume they know all the ways a nuclear plant can fail. But Fukushima, Chernobyl, and TMI show us that you can't predict all the ways. You don't know how many cards are in the deck. And therefore, a PRA will fail. The problems compound it because then the NRC turns around and underestimates the consequences of an accident if it occurs. In most NRC analyses, the accident consequences are on the order of 10 or 20 million dollars. 
Fukushima and Chernobyl are $500 billion. So the NRC's game with a probabilistic risk assessment is they underestimate the probability of an accident, and if one occurs, they underestimate, underestimate the cost to clean it up. Last major thought. The NRC estimates that the chance of an accident are one in a million, and there's 400 reactors. So if you take a million and divide it by 400, that says there should be, using the NRC's analysis, an accident every 2,500 years. But the historic data shows there's been five meltdowns in 35 years. That's an accident every seven years. So if you're a policymaker and you're in your sane mind and you knew that the chance of a nuclear accident was one every seven years, would you build a nuclear power plant? The answer is no. But our policymakers, our politicians and policymakers, are heavily influenced by the nuclear industry, which, um, which convinces them that this 2,500 year probability is the real number. So our, our decision makers are being influenced not by real data. I mean, history says 35 divided by five is seven. Instead, they'll buy what the policymakers say, which is a, a, essentially a nuclear accident between the time Jesus was born and now there would have been one nuclear plant. I mean, that's, that's a long time. And uh, that is the basis for political uh, decisions. Um, I think I'll skip that. Okay, there's one other piece, and that's that, forget the money, let's take the money off the table. This is a technology that can destroy the fabric of a country overnight. Gorbachev in his memoirs has said that uh, nuclear power is what, the, the accident at Chernobyl is what destroyed the Soviet Union, not perestroika. And in my conversations with Khan, he, he absolutely agreed that the, um, the fabric of Japan was torn, not completely yet, yet, um, by the accident of Fukushima Daiichi. And yet we've got Indian Point 26 miles from, um, from New York City. What would that do to the fabric of America if there was an accident? This is a technology that can destroy a culture overnight. Okay, conclusion is that um, uh, former Premier Gorbachev, former Prime Minister Khan, two other Japanese uh, Prime Ministers, Germany's President, Chairman uh, Merkel, and the former Chairman of the NRC, uh, Greg Yaskell, all agree that nuclear technology is something that was okay in the 20th century, but moving forward, there are better alternatives for it. And it's interesting because Gorbachev's a communist, Khan is what we would call a Democrat, the other two guys are what we would call Republican, and then um, Merkel was very conservative. And yet across that broad political spectrum, they've come to the conclusion that moving forward, we should not build any new plants and we should phase out the ones we got. So this isn't Arne Gunderson up here. There's a, a consensus building among world leaders that Whatever we did in the 20th century was okay for the 20th century, but we don't have to repeat it in the 21st century. There are better alternatives moving forward. Um, renewables are doable, and I'd urge you to look at Amory Lovin's site and Arjun Makajani's site to understand that by 2050, we can wean ourselves from this type of, of energy system and, um, and completely change to a distributed energy system, which doesn't need these huge nuclear power plants. Um, one shout out, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up here. Um, there was somebody who saw this with great clarity in 1980, and, and his name was Henry Myers, Dr. Henry Myers. Henry worked for Mo Udall, and he was a science advisor, and the seminal work on the cover-up by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and GPU of the consequences of the accident is a 100-page report written by Henry Myers. He's my hero on the Three Mile Island accident and uh, he's still alive in, in Maine as a matter of fact. Okay, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Arnie. Questions for Arnie Gunderson? Any questions? Holly. Uh, 
Um, yeah, well, it was more like getting hit on the head by a two by four. <laughs> um, I was a senior vice president in 1990. We were a nuclear licensee. I found violations in the license. I told the president of the company and he fired me. I went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission deliberately botched the audit and was taking bribes. Um, I went to John Glenn. John Glenn opened a congressional hearing and um, actually fired up the Inspector General and the Inspector General found that the NRC had deliberately botched the inspection and was taking bribes. And so I was exonerated in congressional testimony. Um, my wife and I were sued for one and a half million dollars. We were driven into bankruptcy, foreclosure, lost the house, lost everything. And um, the NRC didn't lift a finger. And this is what's called the slap suit, you know, when you're sued for a million and a half dollars for telling the truth. And the NRC didn't lift a finger. And so if there's a, a turning point in my life, you know, that, that fork in the road uh, to, for Robert Frost, that was it, 1990. So by 93, when I got reading the, the, the data from, from uh, TMI, um, I looked at it with different eyes. Yeah. Thank so you. until that point, you really had no reason. Oh, I bought this thing hook, line. I actually, even after I got fired, I thought the NRC was going to come and help me. So you know, when I filed my, my report with them, and, and I, I've said this before, it, it was like being in a fort surrounded by Indians. And, uh, and, uh, and the uh, cavalry comes over the horizon. Ah, they're coming. The NRC is coming. And when the cavalry comes over the horizon, they start shooting at you too. And that's uh, pretty much the standard. Dave Lockbaum had the same problem. And, and there's dozens of nuclear whistleblowers who've had the NRC support the industry. Yeah, yeah. So it was a fundamental change in my life, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Back. Yeah, I saw the slide on the, the pressure uh, gauge inside the containment building. Yeah. Where, where did that data come from? Whose data was it? That's that? GPU data. It is. Yeah, it came out in the trial, but it's also, you can find it elsewhere. Uh, I mean, it's not like it's privileged from the trial. Yeah, that, that's, and remember, we were talking earlier about the hydrogen bubble. That was a, a, a Wednesday, this, this, Spike was a Wednesday thing. That hydrogen bubble thing happened on, on Friday and Saturday. So the fear of the explosion actually happened two days after the explosion actually happened, yeah. And we'll, we'll be posting this, the PowerPoint and the, uh, and the, the real text that I shot through um, on, on the Fairwinds website so you can pull it down. I believe in your five points. Uh, I mean, I'm still pro nuclear power, and, and uh, I, I'm waiting to see if any part of the presentation will include the economics of nuclear power and the, the demand for electricity. If we took all your precautions and shut down the plants uh, or didn't modify the plants to, to kind of eliminate your five points, uh, which are still valid. Um, where are we going to get our power from? I know there's yeah. solar <coughs> wind, but you know that's. I hear that a lot, and that's a still, legitimate still question. Central, yeah. You still need central power somewhere, and the alternative of coal is is, is not going to uh, right. replace nuclear power. So, uh, how do you put that in perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. The, um, um, the first off, there's two really good books: um, "Reinventing Fire" by Amory Lovins and. Um, um, Carbon Free, Nuclear Free by 2050 by Arjun Makajani are two books that speak to that. But this, this concept of distributed generation versus central station power is, I think 100 years from now, it's not gonna be pro-nuclear, anti-nuke. What the battle that's being fought now in the beginning of the 21st century is a change in the paradigm between the old central station power and the, and the new paradigm that I believe is happening, which is this paradigm of distributed generation. And um, I, I'm not suggesting shut every nuke down now, but I, I uh, you know, like Yasko and, and, and like Merkel for that matter, Merkel shut down the nine oldest, but she kept the 20, 22 other ones and they're gradually phasing them out by 2022. Um, so the, the, I, I think that, that there will be bumps in the road to get to a distributed generation system is sure. But we've already seen the cost of, of solar drop below the cost per kilowatt of, of nuclear. And nuclear's going up and solar's still coming down. And we're also seeing now that battery technology is coming in at around $1,000 a, a, um, um, a kilowatt, right? I have to think about that, $1,000 a megawatt. 
Yeah. Uh, so the combination of solar plus battery is roughly equal now to, to nuclear. So the economics are, are roughly equal. And what makes the 21st century different than the 20th century is the computer. We can begin to share shift load like we couldn't before. You know, on a peak, we'll, we'll be able to turn your, your, your freezer off for 15 minutes to drop the peak. We can shape the peak anymore. Uh, Amory b says this concept of base load is really uh, a 20th century paradigm, as opposed to what we can do with load, um, load shifting in the, in the 21st century. And the big difference is the computer. It's the same with central, central computers and, te and phones and all that stuff. You know, we've gone from a central system to a distributed system with our phones and our computers. And the last bastion of that battle from centralized to decentralized is the power industry. And my, my position is that building more nukes now is like building the Maginot Line. You no, know, it's f fighting the last war, and that the, 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 the new paradigm is, is a distributed system. Um, will there be bumps in the road? Sure. The, and, but you know, the good news is we got Germany out there to screw up before we do. <laughs> they're, they're in the process. Of, uh, three months ago, they had a, 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 in a on a day, I, I, it was October. <sighs> sometime in October, um, they had a day where at the peak, they made 66% of their power from renewables. And for the day, they made 33% of their power from renewables. And they are only been at it for three years. Now, it was a great day. It was a windy day, and it was a sunny day. So I mean, they still have a long way to go. But here's a, a developed industrial country that, that got 66% of its peak load from renewables already. So. I think um, you know that same commitment that we built 100 nuclear plants in essentially 10 years. If we if we did that uh, and committed ourselves to a, a you know large a large infrastructure and transmission lines, because if the wind isn't blowing in Texas, it's blowing in North Dakota and things like that. If we did that um, with the same investment and the same commitment to it, we could be carbon-free, nuclear-free by 2050. Okay. Yes, Scott. Short three-part question. Oh, short three-part. How about one part? <laughs> what is your greatest safety concern for United States reactors? When will it raise its ugly head? In other words, predict when the next accident Oh, yeah, happens. yeah. You know, my, my wife and I did uh, three weeks before the accident in Fukushima. My wife and I were walking through the neighborhood. You know, old people walk at night. And, and so we were just walking through and snowy and, and all this stuff. And she said, where's the next accident going to be? And because uh, I, I do a lot of expert reports and they're all pretty scary. Um, and I said, I don't know where, but I know it's going to be in a General Electric Mark I. And son of a gun, all the Fukushima reactors were General Electric Mark I. So um, the Mark I reactor concept is known to still be a weak link. We have 23 in the US. Matter of fact, Chuck Casto, uh, the NRC director, said in a, on, on a, a, a telephone call, it's the worst containment in the world. And we've got 23 that are still operating. So that concerns me. The other one are the Westinghouse ice containments, um, which are really hokey. Uh, they rely on all sorts of buckets of ice, and the steam is supposed to go up through them. So I think I'm more worried about the Westinghouse ice containments than I am about the Mark Ones at this point. Any prediction for time? No, I don't, I don't even want to go there. Last time I did that one happened in three weeks. No, 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 I don't want to do that again. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think we have probably time for one more question. I know that your hand was up. Um, well, Arnie, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, you a question about accountability of the nuclear industry and preface it with a short statement that um, following the uh, Fukushima, well, actually leading up to Fukushima, according to the United Nations um, Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, that uh, the standard for evacuation is one millisievert per year. If you get above that, if you're exposed to that, they're supposed to move you. Yeah. Following the Fukushima accident, the Japanese government raised the standard to 20 millisieverts per year. You spoke about the fact that you could not take your case to trial. Uh, we see um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Japanese now living in contaminated uh, lands where they should have been evacuated. Yeah. But so, how is the industry immune, not only to, to uh, accountability, but even to the standards according to the United Nations now? Yeah, the, um, you know, we've got a system where we capitalize the benefits and we socialize the risk. 
with, with nuclear. And you know, in the US, it's Price-Anderson. If there's a big accident, we all pay, as opposed to that, you know, when, when at least when the Gulf oil spill, BP is still on the hook. Whereas if there was a comparable magnitude accident in nuclear, uh, the, the owner of that, that reactor would be off the hook and the taxpayers would be paying. So you know, we've got a system where we capitalize the profit and, and socialize the risk. The, the, but the issue of dose is, is truly frightening, and, and that's really IAEA pressure is coming in on that. The Japanese, tw what's a 20-fold? They 20-fold increase of what was allowable. But, but before the accident, you shouldn't move back into an emergency zone um, if it was more than 100 millirem above background. Then the Japanese changed that to be 2,000 millirem. Just kind of unilaterally, they changed the, the, the criteria. Um, and Japan is um, um, really being driven by the banks. I had a discussion on that that I skipped. What ha was happened is they shut 50 nukes down, and um, they've had them shut down for three years. Where's the money coming to keep the staff and the plants there? The banks are loaning money into these large nuclear utilities, and they want their money back. And there's enormous pressure on the diet to start these plants back up so the banks can get their money. Let's eat. Thank you.